Good morning, everybody. I've got my Saturday morning voice on. I'm sure many others have the same voice. And I no wouldn't normally mic, but I guess they're filming it and they want the voice to go into the, the thing, the camera. And also, there's no clicker, so I'm going to have to stand and manually click. This is all, you know, the, the, the calamities of a non-remote environment, you know? So anyway, OK, that's me. You know, that's cool. Uh, <clears throat> so quick, quick background um, of live CA. So I, uh, I was an you know, accountant like anybody else. Uh, I got fired from PwC, said screw this. I moved to Israel and joined the army. And then I realized that uh, I had to earn money to live. And so uh, I was a military plumber and there wasn't a lot of work in that uh, field. So I came back to Canada and I finished my uh, CPA designation. And my boss who was uh, Israeli and he had most of his clients in Israel. So I thought this is great, it kind of worked out. And after three years there, I thought, well, I really wanted to move back to Tel Aviv. I like the beach, I like hummus, so fine. So I said to my boss, I'm like, can I, you know, you can pay me less money because the salaries in Israel were less and I'll, I'll fly in on my own dime and I'll work remotely. What do you think? This is like 12 years ago. And he said, Josh, if you're not in the office, I don't know you're working. Okay. So, <clears throat> so then I just, I, I moved there and um, I launched a website, which was Live CA. And it was, there's nothing like special about it. It was just uh, me, accountant, I did people's taxes online using Skype, charged by the hour, and that was the thing. Uh, <clears throat> so about a couple months later, uh, I didn't have a lot of clients, but um, I met, uh, I was doing some, some LinkedIn networking, so online networking, really to see who else was doing something like this. And that's when I met Chad. Uh, this is our younger self, so I had hair. And Chad was doing uh, the, accounting system implementation part, and I was doing the taxes, and we said, well, look, if you get your clients online, he had like six clients, I had the five, so if you get your clients online, I can do their taxes, and we can bill each other back and forth, and this will be great. Uh, so very quickly, we realized that we should combine the tax and, we combine, and the tech into one price, and it was like 200 bucks a month, which we thought was we were gonna be millionaires at that point, uh, and so we combined it into one price, and on a monthly subscription, and very quickly went a lot of traction. So three months later, a loan for my dad, and we'd hired our first employees. And that's when I actually flew out to Chad, uh, to, to Halifax, to Tantalon, or Tantalon, I never get it right, which is where he lived, and I was in Tel Aviv, and I met him in person, and that's where the company was actually born. So remote roots. Um, so this is today, so today, actually, so we've had, I mean, I'm sure uh, everyone in the room feels this, if you've got an accounting firm, the, the ups and downs, uh, certainly of the past three years. But January of 2022, we were 100, almost 110 uh, remote employees, and these are all Canadian employees, Canadian payroll, so they're expensive. And uh, uh, today we're about 65, so we reduced the team. That's a whole other story. But so uh, as of last year, we were 100 remote employees. Uh, we were the first virtual firm in Canada to actually get approved. There was a whole bunch of hurdles to actually be a, an actual licensed CPA firm without a physical office. So we were the first ones to get approved. Uh, we've always been remote uh, as far as just the client mix. So uh, a client at Live CA, this is again from last year, but today the average client is about $2 million to about $30 million in revenue, about 10 to 100 uh, employees as far as a headcount. And our average price is 2,500 to about 5,000 bucks a month depending on the service. And it's AP payroll, bookkeeping, controllership tax, right? So full finance team for less than the price of a full-time hire and about 250 clients and we do. We don't do hourly billing, it's all fixed. Uh, okay, so we're talking about remote work and I, you know, how to manage remote employees, but I wanted to just touch on, because I think there's two aspects to working remotely, and one is the actual customer experience, uh, and then the second is, is employee experience. And, and certainly the way we thought of it first was, uh, well, what experience are you giving your customer first? And then, once you define what experience you want your customers to have, then you can come back and say, okay, well, how should we act as a company in order to actually deliver on that, on that particular experience? Um, so the tools, right? Well, you know, Expensify, you might have heard of it. Uh, so the, the tools that we use, and this is from the very beginning, so we started our firm on Xero. Uh, we were one of the first Canadian Xero partners. Um, so it was Xero and Dext, uh, and some of these, I mean, I think they're all in the US as well. You know, wage point rise, you can see some of the, the apps there. But basically, the, the first thing that we imagined, and that's, this is how we founded the company, was on the remote tools, right? So everything that we use from, a, from a, uh, an external perspective uh, is remote. 
And we, we made a number of mistakes over the years to teach people how to use the internet. Uh, we, in fact, we in fact even got into web design in our first year because we thought, well, if we're using all these remote tools and we're doing e-commerce accounting, we can do web design. Don't do that if you're, if you're doing that. It, was, it failed miserably and uh, the client wanted to sue us for uh, reducing his SEO because he had a ge GeoCities site and he thought that was like the thing. But uh, in any event, so the customer experience for us has always been about the, the remote tools. Um, the pricing part, so again, I think today it's fairly, so we take it for granted that fixed pricing is a thing. Uh, certainly like 12 years ago, it was not. Um, and uh, so that's how we, we, we came up with this pricing board uh, at the very beginning. And so the, the, the idea was always give a customer a fixed and predictable experience and not surprise them with a bill every month. And I'm sure I'll, a lot of you have had that conversation, which is why did you bill X hours this particular month, which is not fun to have. Uh, so it was certainly at the beginning, there was a lot of uh, positivity around that particular approach and defining the experience. So to say, rather than people will pay for time, people actually pay for the experience that you're creating. Uh, <clears throat> so one of our, so this is like, I think in year three, and then Chad flew out to meet me in Tel Aviv. It was his first time in Israel. And I took him to uh, this really nice restaurant. And as soon as we walked into the restaurant, so it's like kind of like this, and you walk in through the door, and as soon as you walk in, someone just hands you this glass of red wine. You're like, oh, okay, you know, this is nice. And there was still a wait of like half an hour or something, but it actually didn't matter because you had the wine and whenever you finished it, they kept like pouring it. I thought, this is amazing. And now, it, since that moment, I've actually never had a restaurant experience. And it like, what cost them, I don't know, five bucks, right? And, and you're waiting at the table and all of a sudden the whole experience of waiting turns into this like really delightful thing. And so that's when we actually sat down at that restaurant and go, okay, well, what does it actually feel like to be a customer of our firm, right? So what, you, you sign up and then what? Um, so one of the things that we did actually at the very beginning was as soon as a customer signed up, we sent them this like retro candy basket with a welcome to live CA. And it was really interesting because at, generally speaking at the time, and I don't know how it works today, but referrals only happened at least one year cycle after working with a customer, right? So it's like you go through there, you work with them, and then after a year you do their taxes. Oh, okay, this, this firm is pretty good and they recommend to your friends, et cetera. Uh, for us, as soon as people got the candy basket, they would like tweet about it or they would put it online and go, this is amazing, I love this. We haven't done any work. We haven't done any work. And that particular candy basket actually saved our ass a number of times when we screwed something up or didn't get to something on time. They're oh, okay, we got a candy basket, so it's fine, which is very akin to that wait time. So if you wait half an hour for restaurants, okay, because you got the wine, right? So uh, one of the things we thought from, from the very beginning, which was, what are the, the experience points, right, that are important to a customer if you're gonna deliver this experience? So response times are important. I, again, in the accounting industry, we, we are notoriously horrible at responding to customers, particularly during January to April. Uh, and multiple touch points. My boss, uh, this, this Israeli guy, he used to say, uh, clients are the worst. And the big Israeli athlete said, clients are the worst. Never talk to clients, okay? He had like a thousand clients, so every time a client called, it was like the worst thing in the world, just, and he would just, you know, bill them an hour. All right, fine. As if that, that was gonna, you know, penalize them. So we do multiple touch points uh, throughout the year to make sure that we're actually talking to customers and being um, proactive rather than just do the taxes at the end of the year. And then clear deliverables, right? So in, our, in every proposal that goes out, this is, this is what we're, you're getting. It's not necessarily this sort of ambiguous advisory, because that's where we get into trouble. Uh, but more of this particular report, this particular journal entries, et cetera. And every year we actually beef that up so that, you know, when you look at a proposal today, it's got 5,000 things so that a customer knows exactly what they're getting every month and then there's no actual issue as far as did you deliver on the service or not. Okay, so that's, that's more or less, if you got that picture of a customer experience that you want to deliver, then you can kind of come back to the employees and go, okay, what do we need to do as far as the team in order to, to act on this experience? Uh, so these are just a, a number of components here, which I think make up the employee experience. Now, they're not necessarily um, only related to working online. Uh, working online is simply a medium to be able to provide that experience, uh, but I think they can be incorporated into that. So what I mean, so starting with the vision part, so this is just a nice quote, which is you gotta think about the big things while you're doing the small things so that the small things go in the right direction. And I think we often forget that. So. This is, this is our, our large mission statement. So this is like the full part, so I'll just read it out. So our mission is to be a profitable remote CPA firm that's both a great place to work and delivers a great customer experience. 
Uh, live CA will be a place where people work normal hours, make a good living, treat each other with respect, support one another, and have autonomy over their own lives. So that's something we actually came up with in one of our retreats at the very beginning, and then we went further. So that means having coverage for every role, aligned with the right balance of oversight and support. It means that we won't freak out when people leave, and we'll be able to replace them quickly without overstraining those around them. It means we can take vacations without stressing about who's going to handle our workloads. It means we can stop stressing about our bank account each month, and that we'll have enough buffer to access additional resources when needed. And finally, it means we won't forget the customer and we'll consider the impact on a great customer experience when making our decisions. Uh, so that was clear from the beginning, and today you can really sum this up as high impact work and a meaningful life. Uh, so for the, you know, today perhaps it's referred to work-life balance. I, I don't really like that term because it almost separates these things, saying work sucks, it's nine to five, and then the rest of your life is gonna be awesome. Um, and certainly one of the things we incorporated from the beginning, and at least was my, my personal philosophy having not enjoyed work for many, many years, which was, no, no, if you actually can talk, you know, help somebody um, really do something valuable for that person, it feels good and it generates fulfillment. And uh, so do that, make sure that your work actually has an impact on, on somebody. Uh, and then you also have a meaningful life. So you know, outside of work, at least for me, I've been able to live, I live in Argentina now, uh, so I lived in Israel for four years, then Colombia for a few years, then now in Argentina. Um, and, you know, outside of work, it just enables me to do a whole bunch of other stuff. And so a lot of people from, from Live CA that have joined the team in recent years have subscribed to that uh, purpose, and, uh, which is really cool to see because they all express that purpose in a different way. So it could be a lot of, um, a lot of family, uh, so family members or that have, have big families that have come from big firms and all of a sudden... This is at least at the beginning before remote work was so commonplace as it is today. Uh, they didn't have to commute. They could spend more time with their kids. So that was a big deal. Uh, so Chad, my business partner, has been living in an RV for six years now with two kids and two dogs. So that's pretty cool. Um, so it's, it's actually wonderful to see everyone's expression of that, that particular vision. Uh, <clears throat> so values, kind of closely related to, uh, to, the, to the vision. So if the vision is the why you do something, right? So why work at Live CA? Well, because of the vision. The values is how you go about doing it. Um, so people are your most important asset. Turns out to be wrong. Uh, people are not your most important asset. The right people are. And the right people don't need to be tightly managed or fired up. They will be self-motivated by the inner drive to produce the best results and be part of creating something great. Uh, so. The, just before the, the core values, I think there's this uh, notion, right, of, of how do you manage remote employees, uh, this idea that you have to make sure your employees are working, you have to make sure their employees are delivering, and, and, and that's fine. But I think there is a difference between, um, as, as that quote says, the, you know, having just people and having the right people. And if your people don't actually buy into the vision, uh, we've, and it's hard, I think it's hard to tell, but if they're just showing up because they just want a job, and they're like, eh, this is just a job, you're probably gonna, not gonna get you know, the, the, the best out of them and they probably won't be the best fit, certainly if that is your vision or purpose in the particular environment that we've created at Live CA because it actually requires that particular drive. Uh, similarly, right, when it comes to our values, uh, so the right people are those that share the core values. So buy into the vision and share the values. So in our case, it's empathetic, uh, humbly confident, uh, collaborative, adaptable, and growth-oriented. Uh, when, we, when we came up with this, and this has changed uh, over time, and I'll throw this out there, and maybe this is a question, but we implemented something called EOS about a year and a half ago, which is Entrepreneurial Operating System, uh, where all these values come, came from. And I've always been at this, you know, this, I don't like fluffy stuff, you know, let's do our values, and we're all, you know, great people, and it's, and it's like, like, so what? You know, who wants to work at a company where everyone's, you know, not caring, uh, arrogant, like, it's just a shitty place to work, like, sign me up. So, no. Um, but I will say that, that this has come in handy uh, certainly over the past three years where, you know, uh, as we all know, it's like you want to break from COVID, great resignation, recession, and you just have to constantly adapt. And we sort of found, right, that in, in our people that they were just like, nah, you know, I like the way it was done last year or the year before. And right, okay, I get it. And if you're not adaptable, you're just, you're just not going to last at the company. Um, we used to do these massive retreats, which I'll get to. Uh, until we found hey, we can't spend 400 grand on a retreat or we can't do a retreat during COVID. Uh, so things are going to change. 
Uh, we've had people, like we're constantly changing roles, right, at the company uh, and changing the structure at the company. And again, if you're not growth oriented, uh, which is, hey, I want to grow professionally, if you're not that, then you're going to be very challenged in this remote environment. Collaborative is another one, right? Uh, if we have, one of the things that, we have a three month probation period when someone joins Live CA, and what we find is perhaps the biggest indicator, the biggest red flag that someone's not going to work out is if you just don't hear from them. And then the biggest reason when you go to them and say, like, what's, like are you doing anything? Well, I, I just didn't want to bug anybody. I, I didn't, I don't, you know, I just wanted to do stuff on my own. And sometimes those people are just shy, fine. But if those people are generally just not collaborative because they really like independent work and that's their gig, it's also not going to work, right, with us because we require a lot of collaboration between teams. So that's just kind of a little bit of the idea of how the values actually translate into something quite practical when it relates to remote work. Uh, incentives is another component here. So every successful individual knows that his or her achievement depends on a community of persons working together. Right, so what do I mean uh, by incentives? So this is, uh, I'm sure if, for those of you who have firms, uh, not sure how many people actually use the partner model versus the company model. And I think when it comes to this, certainly a newer generation of workers, uh, millennials, Gen Z, et cetera, the concept of let's work for 35 years or 40 years, and then you'll get this retirement thing as you pass you know, your clients on, is just, it's just not that attractive, right? It's not, it, you know, that, that concept of uh, work forever at one place, and then you get this, this thing, um, it, it, you know, people are not just buying into that. And of course, today, like you have, uh, people are at a company for what, three years on kind of an average, uh, if you're lucky, right? Um, versus whatever it was 30 years ago where you would typically run out your career at a place. Um, so one of the things we did, even though we set ourselves up as a partnership, uh, we never really liked the concept because to me, what, what, a part, what a partnership was in the partner model, it was uh, there's an individual formula. So I did a lot of research to say, okay, well, how do you compensate partners? And it's, well, of course, you find the billable hours of the teams that worked on your files and then there's this like complicated calculation and this is like your take home. Right, so you, what you've done is you kind of create this like all these little mini businesses in a business that no one was really uh, achieving the same purpose. And I, I'm just like, no other company works like that. Like if, if I don't know, I'd expensify. It was like, okay, so these are my clients and you can't touch them and it, you can't really work together, right? So just, uh, so never really got our heads around that. Um, there's no employee participation, so it's like, it sucks, it sucks, it sucks, it sucks, it sucks, now it's great, right? It's just like, so, so again, along the way, it's not great for the employee experience. Uh, you also, again, you, you take all the funds out of the company. And sure, there's this calculation whereby we'll, we'll set a percentage of funds to keep in the company, all well and good. But typically in the partner model, it's let's just sap the company of all the resources, we'll give them to the partners because the partners get all the money, and that's it, and then we'll start again next year. And then you have innovation, and you don't have research, you can't screw up, and you get, right? It just, um, and in fact, like when we, we went through a whole process with KPMG, uh, this is like two years ago, and that was one of their components is like, we have a zero risk policy, we actually don't invest in things. Oh, okay, well, yeah, how do you get, like, how do you do new shit? So, uh, so that was sort of our issue with the partner model, was there's a lack of incentives for the people around the company versus the company model, which, uh, you know, either everybody else does, which is there's a leadership team, uh, there's a salary and bonus structure, which are probably tied to some version of KPIs. Uh, you might have stock options in the tech world. Uh, there might be a version of profit sharing. Uh, and of course, reinvestment for growth, right? And, and the idea being that the end goal here is not partnership, is not this sort of golden handcuff concept, but the idea is that the vision, right? So you get closer and closer to the vision, and which takes a lot of personal work, and perhaps this is just an aside, but, uh, you know, personally having gone, like done this for 11 years now and having gone or asked myself those existential questions, one of the things that gave me kind of this, this uh, reinvigoration of energy um, was that I decided to take on uh, sort of my new expression of my purpose, which is mountain climbing. So I'm now prepping for a big Antarctica trip in December to climb the highest mountain there. I'm not prepared. Uh, so, but again, this is the idea of uh, sort of embodying the purpose and, and constantly kind of reimagining your vision. And what the cool thing is, is I can then stand up into the company saying, guys, I'm doing this, 
and it becomes an act of inspiration. And no, not that everyone is going to go and climb Antarctica or, or climb the highest mountain in Antarctica, but it can inspire people to do things that they might otherwise not have done in the past. And certainly we've had two other employees move to RVs, kind of like Chad, and spend two years in there um, and you know, kind of follow their dreams. So that's, I guess that's the idea of the incentive and tying it back to the vision. And then there's this idea of autonomy. So, so find autonomy in your work. Uh, autonomy is key to feeling good about the work you do, no matter what kind of work it is. Uh, and I'd say autonomy is quite tied to impact. Uh, so the tech company needs to win in the war for talent. This means uh, much greater focus on the employee, not simply as a cog in the wheel or a cog in the machine, but vital member of a programming team. That's in the, the tech world. So as anybody knows Dan Ariely, I, I like him. I think he's canceled now. But in any case, he's a good uh, uh, psychologist or, or behavior, he's uh, a behavioral economist. And he does this experiment with Lego. And you might have heard of this experiment where he's got two groups, and he takes the two groups uh, into a room, and so uh, with one of the groups, he says, okay, you've got you know, 15 minutes. Uh, I want you to build a, a, as many Lego towers as you can. Okay, so group one builds a Lego tower, and once they're finished that Lego tower, um, they come out, he comes out and he gives them some money, like two bucks, cool, and they build another Lego tower, and he gives them some more money, and so people build these Lego towers and they get a little bit of money and he sees how many they can build in a, in a session. All right, so that's, a, that's group number one. Uh, and each time they, they build the, the Lego tower, he just kind of pits them aside. And so you, you know, group leaves the room, a bunch of Lego towers built, they don't know what it's for, but cool. Group number two, same story, uh, you know, X amount of minutes, uh, go build a Lego tower. So first, you know, person builds a Lego tower, they come and give them two bucks, and then right in front of their face, they just smash the Lego tower. <laughs> like, well, we know what the hell. And they just, and they said, oh, build another one. All right, so they would build another one, and then they give him another, you know, $1.50, and then smash it again. And so what they found, right, is that in both cases, like, you're just building a Lego tower for really no reason, but in the group that built Lego towers, got some money, and then they didn't see the smashing, they built, like, they had, like, three times more Lego towers in the other group, which was as soon as they realized that this was, they had no pur purpose, they had no point, um, they just stop building, right? So I think this is very indicative of how humans operate, which is if you don't tie it back to some version of impact, even if it's completely made up or subjective, like in the case of, of a Lego tower, uh, you won't get your people motivated and they won't be really as fired up as they, as they would otherwise be had you created some sort of impact, right? So again, the concept of cog in a wheel, cog in a machine versus every person in your organization counts and making them feel that way is I think key to actually being able to work effectively remotely. <clears throat> and then finally, you've got culture. Uh, so determine what behaviors and beliefs uh, you value as a company and have everyone live true to them. Uh, these behaviors and beliefs should be so essential to your core that you don't even think of it as culture. That's from Shopify. And I think there's, this, there's always a debate of how do you build culture. I do think culture is intentional uh, and culture comes over time. It kind of grows, sort of like a plant. And so one of the things that we did, I mean, our first retreat was eight people, and we took them camping. Uh, and as we grew, uh, we would do all kinds of, of cool stuff, which was cool for us. So at one point, when we were 16 people. We took them to a place called Bear Camp, which was uh, perhaps more dangerous. I wouldn't do it today, but it was uh, at this grizzly bear, grizzly bear camp with this big sort of wooden platform over. And it was like a five-star glamping kind of thing where you could see grizzly bears eating salmon, and there was all these activities. So super cool, like you would never do this uh, you know, with a group of people. And so again, tying that back to the vision. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I think from a cultural standpoint, you know, making sure that if you're gonna do remote work that is somehow uh, threaded in the culture of the organization, right? So that remote work then enables culture rather than heating it. And there's many ways to, to, to do that. Um, and then there's, there's, then there's a tool aspect. So there's the external tools, which I was talking about before, and then there's the internal tools. Uh, and so, uh, sure, there's, you know, Expensify, for example, for our employees, that's what we use. Um, for practice management, we use Carbon. For communication, we use Slack. For to-dos, we use Asana. Uh, Donut is a great app where it pairs people up, especially when we're like 100 people. It pairs people up for a coffee or a donut so they can meet. Uh, 90.io is a great tool for EOS management. Again, a whole other conversation, but uh, we have weekly department meetings called L10 meetings where every department meets and solves issues together. Uh, Guru Card is like a wiki. 
Uh, so all of our information is in, is in Guru. If you want to find out how to do something at Live CA, you search for it in Slack and a Guru card pops up. Uh, and of course, Zoom. Uh, oh, and then we've got Hey Taco, which is uh, a public recognition app. So and it, it, it's funny that it actually works. Uh, some guy in his basement built this thing. And uh, you can, uh, in Slack, we have a, a channel called Heartbeat. And if someone does something nice in a day, it's, it's at, you know, at Josh, great presentation, send you a taco, and then I get a taco, and if you collect tacos, you can get super tacos and other animated tacos, and people love it, and it creates this like really nice, every day, people are calling each other out for public recognition, so uh, super cool, that, that particular app. So again, cr making sure that you have the right tools so that people can connect uh, within the organization, which then contributes to a particular culture. Okay, so that's, that's kind of like the employee experience. And I just wanted to, this sort of second part, I just wanted to give an example of uh, how we do hiring. Because I think that's often a question in the remote environment, which is, okay, that's really good. You know, I, I get your customer experience fine. I get the employee experience fine. But like, how do you hire for these people to join the particular team? In other words, if right people are so important, then how do you find them? So this is the, uh, you know, the employee life cycle. So you've got, you know, hiring and onboarding and support and, Hopefully not, but you know, offboarding at some point in time. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so one of the things that we do when it comes to just the job ad itself is we make sure that we're uh, we're really focusing on that employee experience and sharing it with the world. So uh, we make sure that people understand our culture. We've got the videos of the retreats on the website. We've got some examples of the tools. Uh, we do employee showcases, so people can look up and go, oh, that's what, you know, I learned about a particular employee. Uh, we make sure in every job ad we, we set a career path. So if growth oriented is really important to your organization like it is to us, we make sure that if someone joins your organization, we, they, they understand exactly what steps they're going to take to some version of professional development. Uh, and, and then we're clear about challenging work, right? And we put that in the job description, and that's why you'll see our job descriptions perhaps might more detailed than others because we don't want someone to say, you know, accounts payable clerk, process accounts payable. Okay, great, right? In, in other words, we wanna make sure that someone actually feels valuable, so it might be researching new apps, it might be help clients save money on FX, right? So even perhaps something as simple as accounts payable, we make sure that the idea of challenge or the idea of impact comes through a job description. Uh, so in the hiring process, right, you've got the job ad, uh, an application, uh, that's so far, it's just, that's the standard. Uh, we do a one-way video interview, and that way you really get a sense of someone's presence online. It's about a three-minute one-way video. We use an app before called Kira Talent for that. Uh, now then we design something ourselves. Uh, we screen those, and then we do a two-way interview. And there's two two-way interviews with our HR team and then someone else on the team. And then uh, we just phased this out simply because of the great resignation. It was just hard to get people, and people were ghosting us. But for 10 years, we did trial work days. Uh, and I think, I think we borrowed this from the company Automatic, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if you ever read The Year Without Pants. It's, it's, a, it's not a, yeah, it's a book about remote work, not <laughs> something else. But uh, so in trial work days, uh, which I'll, I'll get to, but basically someone would come in, uh, they'd actually take a vacation from their job to work at our job. How we got people to do that, I don't know. And we paid them, we paid them at the time, uh, it was you know 200 bucks a day or something like that, whatever. And we give them all, we took them through a course, right? We took them for, through a course. And after the trial work day, there was a scorecard and people could vote on them. And only if they passed the trial work day did they actually join Live CA. And when we did that, we got such a high, like the amount of people that actually passed our probation was, was so high with the trial work days uh, that if I compare the time when people were really up for that to now, when it certainly it turned at least, you know, last year when, when the workforce was much more volatile. Um, and it was much more of an employee-centric uh, type hiring process, um, we had fewer people pass probation. Uh, and, and it was just harder to actually assess people without the trial work days. Uh, okay, so, so, the, so the job ad, as I mentioned before, it's very much why work for you. Uh, and in our case, it's showcasing the values, it's showcasing the vision. There's about the role, uh, the key qualities, key responsibilities, the qualifications that you need. Uh, and then we actually send it out. So I think we, we threw our job ad uh, on something called Recruiter Box, which became Trackstar. And you just click a button and it just shoots it out to LinkedIn, Indeed, Remotive, we work remotely, like all those other job things. So, um, <clears throat> you know, making sure that we always post it on uh, the networks where people that want remote work are, are looking. 
so if, uh, if you are doing remote hiring, I would always suggest using an ATS, so application or applicant tracking system. So we used Trackstar. Uh, we now use something called Humi. So we just, we're just switching now. Uh, Bamboo HR is popular. There's Collage and there's a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, but again, I mean, that this allows you to track a candidate through the process as far as what stage they're at. So it's super important for us. Uh, that's kind of what it looks like, like from Trackstar. So it gives you all your candidates and you can see, you know, what the role is. And you can see this is like back in the day, like Skype invitation sent when we were doing the first interviews on Skype. Uh, video interview requested when we did the sent them a, beer, a cure a talent request, right? So someone could actually screen this and see uh, where a candidate is in every stage of the interview process. Uh, the one-way video, so we still do this and, and we, re we really do like it. Uh, so it's, it's the idea, less is more, right? Is someone, and, and so often we would have uh, someone drop out because they go, oh, well, I'm not comfortable on the camera, right? And especially during COVID, if anybody has moved to remote work during COVID, the amount of meetings you have with people's camera off, and like we're all guilty of it. Like when, they, when my camera is off, I am not at my computer. I'm washing dishes, I'm, I'm doing something else, right? We all know that. Uh, so when we had people going, ah, I'm not, in I'm not comfortable in front of a camera, uh, it's a bit of a red flag. Right versus like no, you should be able to get answer three questions, and so it wasn't always the the question the, the actual answers, but rather, are you comfortable just you know presenting yourself in this particular way, uh, and that's why I say less is more, right? So again, if someone dropped out and they wouldn't do the video interview, great, like thank you for dodging uh, dodging a bullet there, uh, and then you can kind of sort of assess based on you know how someone's presence is online, uh, and you can do this. There's a whole bunch of tools now that do do this um, at the time. Uh, you know, we, we, we basically come up with our sort of a custom way, but Breeze HR, Hire Review, uh, there's a number of ways. Uh, what I would suggest in particular today uh, is about the, actually having an objective rating system. So rather than just having your HR person or someone in the company just kind of subjectively, you know, screen through candidates, especially with the notion of DI and, and everything that comes with bias. Uh, so one of the things when we had our HR team come in, uh, put together an objective rating system and actually do some training for the people that were screening so they really understood what to look for uh, and didn't necessarily hire on, you know, someone's bias. Uh, so again, and, and, and when it came to video interview, and this is connected perhaps to the bias, uh, we did have a hiring committee. So the hiring committee did have to go through some training and it might not just be the HR manager, but it could be some manager on the team and goes back to this idea of impact. Anybody could join the hiring committee and we do a cycle through, right? So people are on the hiring committee for a couple months, uh, they do their training, et cetera, they get to part, be part of the, the screening and interview um, and they're out. And of course, you know, one of the things that we make sure is that there's a lot of respect for candidates that actually you know, do this. Uh, the trial workday part. So yes, this is the thing we started from the very beginning. Uh, there was the two paid days, there was like 250 per day. Uh, and same story, we had, we used, um, oh, what's, what was it called? Uh, Teachable, it was called Teachable, was the first, one of the first platforms that we used to do our, uh, our trial work days and run that on. Uh, and then, like I said, we phased it out. But the idea that through Teachable you can create a course, and I'm sure there are many other apps that do this, but so that you can get some version of objective testing. And really, we're actually testing for, like if you skip to the end there, which is cultural fit, effectively that's what we're testing for. Is the person collaborative? Are they asking good questions? Uh, when you throw stuff at them, are they adaptable? Uh, for managers, and uh, it was sort of laugh like looking back, I used, to write, I used to actually do a real client call. So I used to just give them a file in the morning um, and say, all right, you've got six hours to do the file. And it was a real file that we had to do at the firm. And then I'm gonna pitch you in front of a client and I wanna see how you run a client call. Which I don't think you can, I don't know if you can do that today, but certainly at the time, uh, and it was great. And, and um, one of the things I actually really learned when doing that was not just how someone sh showed up on day one, it was actually the change from day one to day two. And it was a candidate's ability to receive feedback. So for example, I might say to a candidate, uh, you know what, why, why don't you spend more, like you just jumped into the tax part right away and you spoke for 80% of the time. You know, in day two, why don't you think about asking some questions? And why don't you actually write down some questions? And when, you, when we saw the change from day one to day two, that was an indication of, okay, this candidate uh, is, is, has that growth-oriented mindset. They're very much open to feedback, which is so key to our organization. I, I would argue so key to any remote organization. Uh, and we, we had the opposite, where we had some candidates go, the, nar the nerve or the gall to give me feedback. I've been working in this industry for eight years. Or, okay, so not a fit, right? And so that's why I say that, that the, uh, for us, that was so key 
to be able to test cultural fit based on how someone would receive feedback, uh, test their professional judgment. Uh, then there's the technical skill and their ability to communicate with the team. Again, we, we, gave, we would give someone access to Slack and we'd actually, one of the scores in their scorecard was, are they reaching out to people? Like, are, are they just spinning their wheels? So you know, I, in that example of giving someone a file, I might get there after, after, I'll check in with them after four hours and go, are you ready? No, I'm, I've been stuck on this bank rec for two hours. Uh, okay, well, you could have reached out to these 10 people, which, which we said, versus the type of candidates that are constantly kind of chattering and asking for help, and those are always our best candidates. Uh, so that was super helpful for us in, in uh, understanding who are the right fit. Uh, and then finally, the concept of, of uh, well, there's onboarding and offer. So this is the onboarding part. Right, so before we get to offboarding, and so kind of like the, the concept of the same, the customer experience is what's the employee experience when they come on, on board. And I, I imagine the in-office experience is so much different because you don't, you don't have to try as hard as you do in the remote environment. Uh, so again, the, the idea of having, so there's, let's call it, there's the employee experience part, uh, and which is the, you know, the cultural part. So we sign them up with a buddy as soon as they start. So they get to chat every day with somebody. Um, we make sure we give them the handbook. Uh, we used to give people swag at the beginning as soon as they signed up, so you get a little package to your house as well, so you get kind of excited about working, uh, as well as a shiny new MacBook, which, you know, at the time was, uh, everyone was working on PCs, so to get like a MacBook and a whole, like, home office set up as soon as you sign up for us was pretty cool for people. Uh, and again, we used the, the, some of those tools, like Teachable, uh, to run someone through a, an onboarding course, right, so they actually have uh, a month to do a course, and, uh, and the course are different modules, and one of the modules was like the zero, because uh, we're a zero run firm, uh, they have like a trial uh, bookkeeping client, so every client actually had to do, every, every uh, team member actually had to do a course in zero, and if anybody had, works with the app, uh, FreshBooks before, another accounting app, so kind of stole that from them, because what they did uh, at the beginning was that no matter what position you were at the company, you had to work customer service for, some, for at least a day, just answer the phones. Right, so you get an idea of who are these people calling. So I thought that was really cool and kind of creates this, this flat experience. But again, uh, the, certainly the onboarding experience of an employee is gonna tie back directly to that culture and directly to making sure that you've got people uh, that have the right fit. Uh, all right, so you know, throughout the, the employee's time at your organization, uh, you know, you've got the onboarding experience, but it doesn't end there. There is the idea of constant support for employees. And that's where you go back of, of you know, culture, career path, challenging work, feedback. Uh, but perhaps, you know, like for example, career path, like that's, that stuff is constantly changing. We encourage employees to reach out. Uh, our our uh, review process, our performance review is structured around someone's career path. What do they have to achieve uh, in order to get to the next phase, right? So again, making sure that the employee experience doesn't stop at the onboarding side, but actually continues. And then offboarding, uh, perhaps one of the most challenging things to do uh, in a remote organization is the offboarding. Uh, so, you know, apropos uh, up in the air, right, uh, Mr. George, and so that's what he used to do in that movie. Um, but at the very beginning, uh, and it is kind of embarrassing, at the beginning, very beginning we thought you couldn't fire employees off, uh, online because that was like way too cruel. So I would actually fly in. It would cost us a fortune. I would fly in from Israel. I would borrow my mom's van. I would show up at someone's house, and we would like take him to uh, for coffee, and we would sit down and we'd like maybe three hours and explain, and then take their equipment. Uh, in today's world, if you show up at someone's house with like a white van, and then they throw them into the van, and then like take all their shit and and uh, and tell them that they're fired, I don't think it's going to fly. Um, we stopped doing that, uh, and so. You know, what we do today is we've got a performance improvement plan. So the first thing that happens for an employee that's not doing well is they go in a performance improvement plan and it's got clear objectives in the plan. And if they, you know, hopefully they achieve that, those objectives and everything's fine. Uh, if they don't achieve their objectives, then they are let go and they have a conversation with uh, an HR person. And then later they have a, a debrief, right? So the first 50 minutes can be, okay, yeah, you know, you're, this is your last day. Uh, and then what we did for, for a long time, which was an actual longer debrief, which was, look, here's, like, you're not in the right headspace to you know, uh, receive any kind of feedback. Uh, and so it might be a, like a longer debrief um, the next day. Uh, but again, we, in, in, in the, um, so going back to some of the tools, so in Carbon, which is our project management, we have an, an employee offboarding job. So there's all those tasks, in, you know, checklist there. Uh, so, you know, security issues, make sure they're, you know, the Zoom is shut down, Slack is shut down, all the apps. 
uh, we, we do make sure that they have a chance to say uh, goodbye to, to, to employees so we don't just, um, I mean, you know, as we all, like the past six months, certainly in the tech world, there's been a lot of this stuff where, you know, 100 people go into a Zoom call, and the next thing they know, their computer's been zapped. Uh, so we try to be a little bit more empathetic and, and come back to our values with that case and, and do give employees the chance to sort of say goodbye to their colleagues in a controlled way. And then we do a public post uh, as well uh, and say, you know, so-and-so is, is transitioning from the company. We wish them all the best. And, and uh, you know, so people know right away. Uh, because one of the worst things uh, is when someone's, again, we found this along the way, right? You fire somebody, people don't know for like a week, uh, and you don't see them in the office because you know, there's no office, and they start messaging that person, and the messages aren't going through, right? So to us, it's actually really important to have almost like a real-time assembly line so that very, very quickly, everyone else in the company knows that someone has been exited, right? Uh, so as far as like learning, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I know, I'm sure today a lot of people are doing the hybrid model, right, of uh, in-office and remote, uh, but there are a number of companies out there that we've learned from over the years that were 100% remote, so I mentioned Automatic, uh, Buffer is another one, uh, Expensify is, is fully remote, uh, Basecamp, Envision, Zapier, so, and, and a lot of these companies, like if you check them out, um, they'll have these handbooks, and perhaps I think like Netflix is the most famous handbook, uh, if you've seen that, um, they have a really good one on culture, which is a, a quick story if anybody knows the Netflix story, which is uh, they basically came up with this whole kind of manifesto on, on culture and what it means to be the right fit. And, they, and one of the things that people at Netflix says is that the person that got you from A to B is not necessarily the person that got you from B to C. And this, this woman, I think Patty, her name was, came up with that. And then, you know, 20 years later, uh, there is this, this moment when the CEO of Netflix actually says, just nods to Patty and says it's time, and like she gets it, right? So in, the, in other words, her, her manifesto is actually well, to me what, what, what exits her. But there's a lot of good content uh, in that. And some of these other companies as well have their own handbooks. And so there's, there's a lot that you can kind of borrow and see if it applies to your company as well. So um, I suppose, you know, takeaways from, from any kind of uh, remote environment, it's it, perhaps the most important, I'd say, is figure out who the right people are for your organization. Uh, get them on the bus, right? Get them on to the vision uh, of the organization. And then the wrong people, which every organization has the wrong people, make sure you get the wrong people off the bus. Uh, create an environment for the right people to thrive and then make an impact and feel supportive, right? So it's not enough to have the right people, but you've got to create that uh, that setting so that they can thrive. And then the final point, which is with the right people in the right seats, and by right seats I mean right function or right role, uh, you'll be able to manage the processes and not the people. Right? So uh, at the end of the day, this is not about managing employees, but rather managing processes, because with the right people, you don't necessarily have to manage them. Uh, they'll be fired up, they'll be motivated uh, to do the work and make an impact at your organization. Uh, that's it. So there's Instagram if anybody uses that thing, but I don't. But uh, you can check out our employee bios there. And uh, with that, I can take uh, any questions if you have any. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, we're part of. So so we uh, we were the first uh, virtual training office to be approved. So we have. Uh, and then Canada works provincially, so we do have CPA students uh, in various provinces that we go through training. We've had to create a whole training program designed around them. Yeah. A couple questions on the uh, public post. Yeah. People transition. Is that sort of whether it's their choice, your choice, it doesn't matter? So, yes and no. Yes and no. So we give people the option, if they're leaving on their own accord, we give people the option to post, right? If it's their own transition, and I think that's very much custom. We have some people that have taken a month to transition out of the company. Um, some people have taken three, right? Others that just give their two weeks notice, perhaps it's, right? But often we like those, we encourage people to do their own post, right? And then it's, perhaps it's part of the culture and say thank you, and it actually is nice when that happens. But when someone is is you know exited from the company on our accord, then no, there's we don't we do the post for them. And then when you say public, that's public to the company, not necessarily. 
yeah, social media. Yeah, like, See you later. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's not like a LinkedIn vertical post. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a public on Slack, our Slack channel. Yeah. So I think you know when I again when I when I was at PwC there was the notion was let's hire cohorts right of people of associates so I was in a cohort of sixty because they knew that only ten would last and, and that was it was a business model right it's like let's pay them shit stream like shit and then year four we only have 10, 10 manager slots right you you actually it didn't like. They couldn't possibly get six, even if it was 60 rock stars, they couldn't, they didn't have room for it because that was, the assumption was is that the majority were going to leave. So that's why I go back to that incentive. So uh, for us, I think we've got a lot of pathways for a trainee. So for example, uh, a lot of people will come into our organization at the bookkeeper level, right? And because the way our certification was, was done is that as a bookkeeper, you can also get experience for your certification. So they would, they, there would be a lot of steps for that person to work through and get to the next level. So maybe here's another metaphor I'd say of what we've, what we've learned over the, over the years. And I do this maybe uh, for anybody, like I do calisthenics. That's like my exercise, right? And I've been thinking about this a lot because, you know, as much as like everyone wants to criticize millennials, whatever, I mean, I am also a millennial, right? As, like, technically. And so <clears throat> I'm very impatient. And so this is what I think what we had, and maybe this, this, is, this relates to your question, which is oftentimes, like, we have people come in the organization and go, okay, when can I be CEO? Like, you just, you just started, right? Like, it's not, you don't get to you know, six months. No, it takes a long time. And when I, when I started calisthenics, it was, you know, I wanted to do all these, like, cool moves, a handstand or a muscle up or whatever. And if someone had said to me, like, Josh, look, it's going to be five years, and you have to train four days a week, and you have to eat well, and like, it's, you're just not going to do it for four or five years. I'd be like, this, is, this sucks. Like, no, I'm not going to wait four or five years and put all that work in. Like, I want to do it now. So instead, right, this is, and this is how like, my trainer worked, was like, yeah, you can, no problem. You can, this is easy. Look. And he would do a muscle up. I'm like, oh. And of course, I couldn't do it. He's like, oh, well, can you do this? And he would do some other move. I'm like, oh, I can't do that either. He's like, well, okay, well, this is what you just actually need to get to this to be able to do muscle up. So can you do this? And it was, you know, can you do 10 pull ups? So, it took me, you know, X amount of time to do 10 pull-ups. And so that's kind of the thing that we try to do with our associates, which is more of the skills training. Like, here are the skills you need. Sure, we can give you an idea of how long it takes there, but hey, if you're really, really good, you can do it fast. Now, it will always take, right, that time, because we know that's the case. Uh, but that's actually oftentimes, I think, what keeps associates motivated, particularly when it comes from going from an associate to like a manager role. They all want to be like the, what we call client service managers in front of clients, which we know can take four to five years. Uh, but, if we, but as long as you're giving them little taste, like, hey, you can try a client call. Why don't you prep? Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to be in front of a client without prep. Like, okay, well, so you could maybe take six months and, and, and do that. So we try to do a lot of that. And it's like finding that balance between giving someone enough autonomy so they don't fall in their face or get injured in the case of sports. And in our case, it's screw something up you know, really bad and lose a client relationship or whatever. And that's, so it's, it's hard to develop, I think, but you have to kind of create a little bit of padding there so that people do, right, feel like they can advance uh, fast. And, and to that end, we've actually had historically low associate turnover, I think, for that reason. Go ahead. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, you're asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure I wasn't cutting no, no. But after the, the novelty of the happy hour during COVID wore off, it became harder to try to create the water cooler discussion when you're dispersed across the entire world. So what, besides obviously like your hey tacos or things like that where you're trying to give accolades to people, how does your group try 
try to build a collaborative environment through relationship when you're trying to also get work done? So, good question. I actually think it's much more challenging to go from in person to remote. Like to make that switch is actually very difficult. And I think it, it has to do with the culture. It's like all of the processes in the organization uh, create a certain culture and then translate right into what your organization is. And so we were lucky in the sense of like it was built on the foundation of our organization, which was remote and not remote because that's what we had to do. It was remote because I'm in Tel Aviv, Chad was in Halifax and that's like that was just part of our life mantra. Uh, in, that, in that transition case, I think it's, it's, so like I said, it's very difficult. And so the only, I think the only thing that we've seen work with some of our customers, because we had that discussion with a lot of customers during COVID and go, hey, you guys have been doing this from the beginning, like give us some tips. And so I think if you're doing that, you almost have to like reinvent your, your culture and go, okay. And so, yeah, just taco alone or just donut is not going to cut it. You actually have to, like, it's like the aggregate of all those things. So you almost have to do a whole bunch of stuff and then see what works. And so like, I didn't go into it, but we have like beer and games once a week and we have a Friday social call and we have um, uh, like people did do physical meetups, like co-working, there was like a travel channel and we did a travel allowance for people uh, when, when, when we could, uh, this is like after when we couldn't do retreats so they could meet up. And it was like trying to create this balance between some in-person interactions uh, and then also like building relationships uh, online uh, client calls, for example, are always done is either two or three people with a customer so that they all get that experience, right? So everything that we do, I think, at the organization is in the background is that idea, which is how do you kind of connect people? And I'll be honest, we still haven't figured that out in the sense of like, I don't, you know, every new employee has to meet me and Chad or like as part of their probation just for like a, a, a chat. But you know, sometimes that's the, it's the only time I'll see them for like a year and a half simply because we don't have those sort of random interactions. Perhaps I think if you're beyond the fact of being intentional, I think you just have to live with the fact that it's not the same. It will never be the same. And so if you're trying to make it the same, it's, good, it's, just, it's, gonna, it's a losing battle versus what other benefits can we accomplish if we have to work this way? Mentoring is going to be a lot easier um, versus when you're mid or late in your career and you're like kind of autonomous and understand how to adapt uh, a little bit better. How has your company dealt with the challenges of like those entry level positions that haven't been in a, a mentoring or a, or a collaborative environment? They don't get the same like face time. <coughs> so uh, so if I understand the question, it, it's it, you're saying like how does how does a new person in the organization is it how do they get that FaceTime or mentorship experience? It's sort of like what you were saying at the beginning of your um, your presentation where your old boss was like, if I don't see you, I don't know if you're working. Mm. Um, for people who are just coming out of college, they're they're entry level. Like, how do you manage expectations of like what what remote work encompasses uh. versus like if you're in the office. See that. Okay, so I think I understand. So it's you know how do you, is it, is it like clear deliverables? I mean, it's like what do they actually? Sure. Okay, so when I was in the when I was at the old job, the way that they manage workload was how many files you have in a pile on your desk, right? So this is true. There's like a, a partner would come, they'd see your pile is small, and each folder because they all did paper was represented a year end a tax file. They go, oh, Josh, you only have three, and then they just like mm -hmm. load me up, and that was it, right? Uh, for us, every every so our organization runs like the, the revenue generators are what we call our CST pods, which are client service pods, uh, managers and associates. And you know, they're kind of like the project managers or account managers of all the clients. And you know, depending on the services that a client engages, they might engage on bookkeeping, AP, and payroll, but every client is assigned to an account manager, right? Uh, so to that end, each manager and associate has specific files that they do. So when you are a new person in the organization, on your, like in your first month, you are assigned, like in, in our job management system, uh, there are X amount of jobs assigned to you personally, right? And you actually, and there's due dates on every single job and you've got to accomplish every job. And the manager is going to oversee, right? And go, you know, are you doing these jobs or not? So uh, 
I'd say I, like it's just very clear deliverables and having perhaps a really good project management system so you can see exactly what someone's doing. And we follow up. If they're not checking their tasks off, if, they, if something passed a due date, the manager's running that report constantly. So it's sort of like what you said but with her question. Like, it is just a different, you just have to create a different way to, you, to you, have those tasks and have those deliverables versus in an office where you're a manager and you can go over and be like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, I mean exactly, and, and and we do t we do we didn't for many years, and we we did we then implemented time tracking about five years ago, not necessarily to see if anybody's working, because what we learned is I guess we successfully created a, or, an organization where people do actually they do too much work oftentimes, and they complain about their capacity, right? Or work is not distributed properly, uh, and that's why you, we've got the, these reports. Um, but yeah, I, I I mean certainly if. If an organization runs like in the old way, which is just kind of subjective, which is, oh, you know, you're not busy, like here you go, I think it's very hard to create in that in a remote environment. Okay. Cool. I think yeah, that's the cool work online and in the office anyway. I think that's a good idea. Just generally just have that kind of task based task based approach. But in terms of good and bad points, how do you get the what you have to what you have to design in that communication to say like yeah, you have a set theme. This client is like constantly taking a piss and doesn't send them the information on time and all that. How do you manage that kind of decide the good and bad problem? Oh. Yeah, let's see if I can hear. I'll, just, I'll show you something quickly and see if I can do this. Um, so, okay, so this is our minimum price calculator. So this will this take this grabs time data and it will tell you. So here I'll give you an example. Like um, all right, so here's a client. So this is their actual price, right? And then over here, like you've got all the hours of the, of the various employees. So, and this is, it's a cumulative uh, four month average. Uh, this is so that this didn't come through, but it basically it takes, it, it grabs the, you know, how many hours are we spending for the, you know, for each of the four months? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so we can see that like this client, like the required price should be 3,600 bucks. Uh, the actual price is 3,500. And we have, a, we have an aggregate report that can, I can look at all the clients. So this is an example of like, okay, this client is maybe they need to be priced an extra 200 bucks a month, but like pretty good, right? Uh, I'm trying to think of like another a client that like I know is not great. Let's just see. Because uh, I know that we're going through some of these. Okay. Um, you know, here's an example, right? So the actual price, 2,500. You know, look at the hours. Like they're just, they're, their team exploded. They were just adding many people and firing people, right? So we had the conversation with them. Guys, you know, it's, it's uh, I can see this on the report. You're using lots of payroll hours. Yeah, well, I, we think twenty five hundred bucks a month is a great deal. Well, that's fine, yes. right? It's, it's it's great, but yeah, it, it's right. It is a great deal, but you've got you know eighty people or ninety people in your payroll. You're constantly changing. Like we can't do this. So what we've what we've just started to do, and, and we used to think of clients holistically, good and bad, like because we used to do value pricing, and now we're actually doing price by service. So the question is, you know, rather okay, if if your budget is twenty five hundred bucks for this, what do you need to do, right? And so. In this particular case, it might be something as, as simple as like uh, take back payroll, and then we can keep your price the same, right? So that's that's I think the majority of our conversations it runs like that, versus and we it's always priced to sort of suss out the good and buy clients, and then you have like hopefully it's the one off like the just the clients that are just shitty people, and you know you should just we don't we try not to work with them. Yeah. Um. So obviously, um, before COVID, lots of students yeah, would just um, go to classes in person. Mm -hmm. During COVID, they had to work remotely or study remotely. Yeah. Have you seen a difference in the mentality and their way to basically work remotely in your company between the ones that used to go to class before COVID and the ones that are now, uh, like the generation of students that have gone through their uh, unit years yeah, basically working from home. Hmm. Have you seen a difference in quality? So I don't know if it's a difference in quality. Like, I, so my girlfriend would she would teach at a university, and, and every student would have their camera off, right? And it just it was really hard to like command a room. So I know that that goes on right now in classes. Uh, perhaps because of our onboarding process, and we make people turn the camera on, so we don't actually see that, or those people that are like that don't get weeded, you know, get weeded out. Um, what I would say though for us is that like for so many years just working remotely was like our differentiating factor, right? So it was like so, so clear, you know, five, six years ago it was like 
people would go to their CPA exams and people would know, like at least in Canada, I was like, oh, you're working with live CA, like what's that like, like working remotely? And like people thought it was really cool because we got to, we did all these meetups all over the world. Um, yeah, people came to meet me in Argentina and co-work there, like it was super cool. But today it's, it, that's lost its, like you gotta find something else. So I'd say that, that you know, in some, in some sense that we are struggling with that of like redefining ourselves in, in so there's this world where remote work is taken for granted and go, well, okay, so if it's not that, if everyone works remotely, then what is it that makes our organization perhaps different than others? Um, and, I, and, and maybe that's just it, right? It's like a constant sort of rethinking of, of what makes your remote work different than someone else. Thank you. Thank you.